The Big 12 era has begun, and BYU Cougars football is on the air. Goes deep down the middle, wide open as Cody F makes the catch. 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, he's going in, touchdown! We are two hours away from kickoff, and it's time to get you ready for the matchup with Cougar Pregame Live. Cougar Pregame Live is brought to you by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Cougar Pregame Live is also brought to you by Tucano's Brazilian Grill. Phenomenal flavors, a festive setting, and more fun than you can shake a skewer at. Also by Siegfried and Jensen, helping Utah families for over 30 years. Now, to get you ready for today's game, alongside Hans Olsen, here's your host, Jason Shepard. Good morning, BYU fans. Welcome into Mountain America Credit Union Cougar pregame live. Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Today, the BYU Cougars look to start the season 2-0 and oh, as they face the Southern Utah Thunderbirds. These two teams have not met since back in 2016. Let's put that into perspective. That means that the last time that the Cougars and the T-Birds faced each other, BYU's quarterback was one Taysom Hill. My name is Jason Shepard. Thank you so much for joining us for BYU Football. Joining me, former Cougar. You know him. You love him. He gave me one heck of a bear hug today. His name is Hans Olsen. Hans, how you doing, man? What's up, man? How you doing, Shep? Look at that nice little I love love it. What's up, BYU fans? What's up? We're out here. Man, you're beautiful. We're out here in Cougar Canyon getting you ready for the big matchup. And, uh, hey. As it was once said, the games are in the afternoon again. Yeah, they finally are back in the afternoon again. Yeah, I did go to give you a hug. It feels like you've eaten your protein this morning. I have eaten my protein this morning. That is a you can always count on that, my friend. You yes. are chiseled. You are chiseled <laughs> iron, Chef. You are. I can't hurt you. You're chiseled iron. I don't think that's true. <laughs> oh, it's very true. I'm so pumped. I'm pumped because every single game that I prepare for to get ready to call, I find a reason to be nervous about. Yeah, oh, I'm the same way. You do the oh, same thing? 100%. I, my team could be favored by 50, and I'm like, oh, we're going to be the one team that loses. Yep, I do the same, and, <laughs> and and that's the way I used to prepare as a football player. I used to prepare like, oh, man, our backs are against the wall. Everybody doubts us. The chips are stacked <laughs> against us. I used to prepare that way for every single game, and now I do the same for my calls. Yep. I sit there, and I'm like, okay, well, what do you got to watch out for? What do you got to be careful with? Look, Southern Utah gave Arizona State a run yes. for their money, yep. and there were all kinds of awkward things that happened. I know we'll get into some opponent look, but I'm just telling you right now, come out, play base, take care of business, do it early, don't screw up, because Southern Utah is coming up here to Provo to try to put on a show. Well, and look, BYU's 1-0, but nobody seems to be too excited based on how the game played out last week. Now, we're obviously talking more on the offensive side. The defense was fantastic with the shutout, um, but, but I, I'm assuming you and I are on the same page here. We both expect a completely different offensive football team today. A thousand percent. It needs to be a different offensive team that comes out today. It needs to have a little bit more crisp, a little bit more precise type performance because it was so loose and there were drop passes and there were crazy first downs and there were bad blocking schemes and there were there were different gap issues. So 100%, they need to come out, be more precise. But, Shep, I, I got to imagine we both agree that Aaron Roderick and Fessy Sitake going down to Harvey Unga and – Coach Clark mm-hmm. and on down to Coach Funk, they're, they're all back in the room. These are coaches I trust. Mm-hmm. I trust them across the board. These, these BYU offenses have not let BYU fans down. So I'm not overly concerned that we're going to see the same style performance that we saw against Sam Houston. All right, well, let's continue that conversation before the Cougars face the T-Birds. Let's get to our game notes. <laughs> All right, so let's start with the offense. Will the offense take a step forward? As we mentioned, only 14 points versus Sam Houston. And, and a lot of miscues, a lot of confusion. And I think, there was, I think there was a lot of confusion from fans as to why there was confusion on the field. Yeah. Well, there were just new faces, new people. It's like when you brought me on the broadcast for my first show last week. How bad was I? I was all over the place. No, 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 no. You no. corrected me five times. Well-oiled machine right over here, by the way. <laughs> Barry shut off my mic. Barry came <laughs> over and he said, do you even know what you're doing? It's just when you get new faces, whether it's on a broadcast or on a field, it's really difficult because 
you you know you got these bright lights you got different alignments the alignments look different than what you practiced against scout team the week following and then you see an audible and you're looking at the hand signal and you think you see one thing but you're seeing another and and you have confusion i think that that really settles down this week on the offensive side of things when you're running a zone scheme shep it takes a little bit to really unify across the front front to get to understand when I cross a defensive lineman's face, the guard behind me needs to be able to pick up that defensive lineman. That's a zone concept. It's not a man concept. It's a zone concept. And what was happening on the backside of poles, counters, traps, the the down block wasn't picking up the right zone scheme. And so the backside D tackle was getting into the play on some of those run plays. It's little stupid things like that that you go back to the film and you're like, hey, Here's an idea. We need to seal off the backside every time we run a counter, every time we run a trap. If we don't seal off the backside D tackle, we got problems. Yeah. So it's those little things that they can clean up. And, and look, if I'm seeing those things, Coach Funk is definitely yeah. seeing those things. And if Coach Funk is seeing those things, I assume he's going to get those cleaned up. How much more of an emphasis on the ground game do you expect? Because really, there was, there was not a consistent – ground game until the second half and that was lj martin that came in 91 yards in his byu debut he looked fantastic i expect you know whether whether it's Deion smith getting some run obviously aiden robbins and lj all those guys i expect to see more focus on the ground game today i, I do too and we talked about first down play calls last week remember we really went into this during the broadcast first down play calls last week they had 12 first downs in the first half. They passed on nine of those first downs. They had five first downs in the second quarter. They passed on all five of those first downs. And what was happening was an incomplete, a confusion in route, uh, a, a, a wide receiver missing a block, a defender coming up and making a tackle for a one-yard gain. And then you were getting into second and nine. And then on second and nine, you're trying to run. And, and you've got Sam Houston that was stacked up, and they were forcing out the run. And so then you were in third and yeah. seven, and third and seven was going really poorly. So here's the solution. Come out, put it in Aiden Robbins' hands, get a couple of those blocking schemes going the right way, get yourself into second and four, and now you can take a look down the field. Because you know in second and four, and you have a miss, you get to third and four. Okay, well, we still have options. You still got you still got all kinds of possibilities out there, so I want to see maybe a little bit more run focus on first down. I one thousand percent expect Aiden Robbins to start this game, mm-hmm. and I expect him to look better in this game against Sam Houston. Aiden Robbins had seven carries for twenty three yards. I'm expecting something around twelve to sixteen carries, and I'm expecting somewhere between ninety to one hundred and fifteen yards. For Aiden Robbins. That's what it needs to look like in order for us to prepare and take this show on the road to Arkansas. Yep, absolutely. That it has to look like that. It's got to be Aiden Robbins as a power back that understands pass protection because it's not just about him running. It's about him feeling comfortable in pass protection. And I don't know if you went back and watched the film. LJ did a lot of good things in the run game. He got taken back and put on Slovis' lap in the pass pro. So there are a lot of importances to getting Aiden Robbins going. On the defensive side, a shutout performance. They looked really, really good in game number one. And I think, I think today's probably, you're probably on, the, on that side of the football looking at, let's, let's, let's continue that. Let's try and build off of that and see what we can do in week two. And let's, based off of what we did in week one, let's see how much is sustainable moving forward. Well, because everybody forgets if it doesn't sustain, right? Right. Everybody forgets if it doesn't happen week one to week two to week three, by the time you get to week three and week four, week one didn't matter. Right. You don't even remember the shutout. All you've got is a bunch of boo birds and a bunch of hate coming your way. So, yes, you want to follow it up. And the way I follow that up, but this is me. Okay. And I'm a gambler, although I don't gamble, but I'm a gambler. You are the Kenny Rogers of this show. I take that intensity dial, uh-huh. and I just crank that sucker up to, like, from what was probably a five against Sam Houston, I crank it up to about a seven and a half, oh. and I just say, all right, let's go play a little bit. Let's go play a little bit. Let's go see how ugly we can make this game for this 
for this Southern Utah offense. All right, speaking of Southern Utah, we will get the lowdown on the T-Birds with Spencer McLaughlin. This is Mountain America Credit Union Cougar pregame live. Spencer joins us next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Alongside Hans Olsen, here's Jason Shepard. The Cougar Walk is happening as we speak. Welcome back to Lavelle Edwards Stadium. In fact, we're just outside in Cougar Canyon on the west side of the stadium. The BYU football team making their way through the Cougar Walk. Lots of Cougar fans here with their hands out, getting high fives as we get you ready for the Cougars and the Thunderbirds of Southern Utah. And speaking of the T-Birds, Spencer McLaughlin calls the games for Southern Utah on the radio, and he joins us out here. Spencer, thanks for taking a few minutes. We appreciate it. Hey, you're very welcome. Thanks so much for having me, guys. What a great atmosphere you guys have up here in Provo today. Saturday in college football. This is exactly where it should be. This is exactly where things should feel. Absolutely. How does it compare to Sun Devil? There weren't as many fans out in, uh, in Tempe <laughs> as there know, were in Provo today. I know that's the truth. And what, probably about 30 degrees cooler? Uh, it's, it's a little bit more mild. It was about 10, 15 degrees hotter, and it was about six hours later, later in the day. But... Yeah, the, uh, the ASU had fans had kind of an empty stadium after the two-and-a-half-hour lightning delay that yeah. had the game end at 1 in the morning. Oh. Uh, God help us all if this game ends at 1 in the morning, gentlemen. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I think we can go ahead and pencil in that that's not going to happen. I'm going to speak that into existence. I would have penciled that in for last week, too. I'm not counting my chickens before they hatch. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about that. This is a – that's honestly a game Southern Utah – has a case they could have won that game. I, I'd make the case they should have won that Ab- game. Absolutely. Okay, so they're coming in. Yes, they're coming in 0-1. But they're coming in a confident bunch, aren't they, they? They absolutely are. And Delane Fitzgerald knows that, and he's not a guy who's going to take moral victories no matter who the opponent is uh, against. And he's somebody who's going to have his team ready to play hard every single week. That is what his identity is as a head football coach, is it, culture first and making sure everybody knows what their job is. Do your job and do it to the fullest extent week in and week out. And I know that's something Coach Sataki, who's walking by in front of us here, knows uh, very much as well. And Coach Fitz, you know, what you can know about a Delaney Fitzgerald coach football team, they're going to come out and play hard every single week, no matter who the opponent is. Arizona State learned that last week, and BYU should be prepared for that as well. Talk about an opportunity to win, too. Seriously. It's 24-21. Southern Utah's got the ball with five minutes left. Justin Miller pulls back, throws a pass on third down that should have been complete. It's not complete, and you really never get the next chance after that. Take me into Justin Miller and his game, what you saw from him. And then, Spencer, more uniquely, talk to me about Grady Robinson's usage. Is that something that BYU needs to prepare for, a two-quarterback set, or is it all Justin's game and it was just a rare occasion for Grady against Arizona State? It'll be about 95 to 98% Justin Miller behind center. You will see Grady Robinson. There's no N in his name. It's just Robinson as a Wildcat quarterback for maybe a snap or two. I wouldn't call it a key feature of the Southern Utah offense, but last year when they went up to Salt Lake City and played the Utes, Grady Robinson scored the only touchdown that Southern Utah scored in that game. Final score was 73-7, to and hopefully it'll be a little bit closer (laughs) here today in in Provo for everybody. But I, I think when you look at what Justin Miller brings to the table, it starts with the intangibles and the presence that he has. This is an experienced, veteran, old quarterback in the age department, something BYU is, of course, very familiar with. Miller is an experienced guy, uh, a guy who just comes into the huddle, knows exactly where everyone needs to be. He, he knows how to execute the offense. He, he understands what his offensive coordinator, he's had three in the last three years, but in every offense you see him not forcing the ball, not making bad decisions, making accurate throws, delivering the ball on time and on target. He, he's just a real veteran leader and extension of the coaching staff on the field is what Delane Fitzgerald describes him as, and that's absolutely how he plays the game. Well, and he's about to set some records for Southern Utah, isn't yes, he? Yes, he is. Yeah, not, not necessarily here today, but if he stays healthy this season, he'll probably leave Southern Utah as uh, the school's all-time leading passer, leader in uh, snaps, completions, and, and you know he, he's just had such a phenomenal career. He's been so productive, so solid, and so steady. And you know the last couple of years against Power 5 opponents, it's been a struggle. It, it has definitely been a struggle for the Southern Utah offense with Miller at the helm. But he played much, much better uh, against Arizona State. The key for him that Coach Fitz talked about going into the game with the Sun Devils last week, his receivers have to be able to separate. You know, I asked him about, hey, last two games against Power 5 opponents, uh, you know, Utah the year prior and then Arizona State the year before that. Justin Miller.
Miller had thrown for under 100 yards in both games with several interceptions. He said it's not as much on Justin Miller as it is on the receivers, and they stepped up against ASU. You saw Zach Mitchell, the redshirt freshman, four catches for over 50 yards and a touchdown in that game. Isaiah Wooden had a 50-yard reception. They had an early completion in the game to Ethan Bolingbroke, who's out in the first half because of a targeting penalty. Thankful, thankful, or not so much to the worst rule in college sports, or one of them, <laughs> anyway, that we kick kids out of games. But that's a discussion for another day, perhaps. But uh, there are weapons here that they have to be able to separate against this BYU secondary uh, because the offensive line knows how to hold up in pass protection. All right, Spencer, let's talk a little bit more about the Southern Utah offense. Ty Hyatt is the offensive yep. coordinator, and he is a, actually a student out of South, South Virginia, if I'm not uh, Southern Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. I think he came from Southern Virginia and then followed Delane Fitzgerald. But he seems to really run a heavy option set. It's almost every play, whether it's a pass or or it's a run play, it's attempted to be put in a belly of a running back or pulled. It just seems like there is a lot of movement. Is that something that was specific to Arizona State, or is that something that you saw last year as well? Well, you know, it's his first year as, as the OC with Southern Utah, so I think we're still getting a feel for what the offense is with Ty Hyatt at, at the helm, but he's someone who definitely had some RPOs into the playbook last week, and, and I think they use that as an extension of the running game because Justin Miller, for all the things he brings to the table, a high level of mobility is, is certainly not one of them. He's no Taysom Hill out there running around behind center. So to kind of expand the running game, give you more options rather than just having you know a, a straight handoff with a traditional pocket quarterback like Justin Miller, th- that's something that I think Ty Hyatt wants to bring to the table. They completed a couple really, really effective RPOs against ASU, but what does that come down to? The receivers have to win their one-on-one battles. Yeah. And you look for Isaiah Wooden, you look for Zach Mitchell to be the top targets in that sense. All right. All right, one last thing before we let you go. Let's talk defense. And I know there was a ton of turnover in the secondary. Coach Fitzgerald not pleased with what he had in his secondary. So a lot of guys that are new to this season uh, with this team. I asked him, and and our listeners will hear my my one-on-one conversation with Coach Fitzgerald coming up in a little bit. And in in that, I asked him specifically a question about the linebackers. But he, he, he broadened that and answered it saying how much he loves his front seven. Talk to us about the, the defensive side of the football for the Thunderbirds. Yeah, the linebacking unit is I, – I haven't seen everybody else in uh, the UAC just yet, but, boy, they look like they'd be the best in the conference. They are so deep, so talented, versatile, athletic. Connor Colmore, the reigning freshman FCS All-American, leads the charge there, but Aubrey Nellums is an experienced player and maybe the most dynamic athlete of the bunch. Then you look up front, Robert Horsey comes over from Frostburg State where he was a dominant player over there at the Division II level. You look at guys like Rylan Suofilo and Peyton Payne have just been disruptive forces and E.C. Purcell had a sack last week against ASU. The defense is the strength of this team. Make no mistake about it. There are pieces on the offense that I really, really like with the Southern Utah team, but last week and really last season as well, they struggled to run the football consistently and if you're talking what's the more well-rounded unit on this Southern Utah team, I think it's the defense because you've got playmakers and depth at all three levels, and I was so impressed with their secondary last week. Arizona State's got some real weapons, Elijah Badger, Xavier Guillory, Jalen Conyers, and they more than held their own. Just three points in the second half after the lightning delay on the road against an FBS team. The front, the front seven, they did an excellent job containing the run game with Cameron Scadabo as, as best they could, the Sacramento State transfer. But that secondary really, really held up well. They have some key transfers, Lacaria, Pleasant Johnson, Javon Lewis, and the like. They, they were really good. George Ramirez recovered the punt and returned it for a touchdown that really gave us that moment of, hey, we, we, we got something here. We might be able to pull this off, and they, they very nearly did. So I, I love what they bring to the table defensively, and their coordinator, John Kelling, is really, really sharp. Spencer, we appreciate the time. We'll, uh, we'll let you... Uh let you head back up to the press box. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes. Uh, good luck walking through the sea of blue in your red. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that now. It's uh, not exactly going to be a difficult game of Where's Waldo for Spencer out there. <laughs> exactly. The sea of blue. Well, great, great stuff, great insight, and have a great call today. Thanks, Thank you Spencer. very much. Appreciate it. Go T-Birds. There we go. That is the voice of the Southern Utah Thunderbirds, Spencer McLaughlin, joining us. When we come back, we're going to get defensive in this week's Shep Talk. My conversation with cornerback Jacob Robinson coming your way right after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Let's get you back to Jason Shepard and Hans Olsen for more Cougar Pregame Live. Brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Here's what you don't know. There's a little peek behind the curtain here. 
Sorry, that, that new music bed that, uh, that you just heard, Here's what you don't know is that Hans is playing that guitar riff live, uh, and uh, it, it happens every break. Oh. You're amazing, by the way. Well, I appreciate it. I was the backup uh, guitarist for Hall & Oates. So. Okay. Hall & Oates and Hans. <laughs> yeah. Hall & Hans. There we go. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> Welcome back in. This is uh, – Cougar pregame live brought to you by Mountain America. Mountain America is the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Last week, quite the performance from Jacob Robinson. Two interceptions in BYU's defensive shutout of Sam Houston in week one. The Orem native began his career at Utah State, but is now a fixture at corner for the Cougars. I talked with Jacob for this week's Shep Talk. Here's our conversation. After the game, I'm, uh, I'm on uh, social media, and I, I see Marie Osmond giving you the shout-out. We're talking like BYU royalty here. You have a close relationship with the family. That's got to be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I grew up with um, her younger kids. So I used to hang out with them a lot when I was younger. They lived in our neighborhood, so it was cool. I, I did want to ask you before we get to football stuff, too. Zero. I was talking with Cody Epps for uh, a podcast we were doing a couple weeks ago, and he was telling me why he picked zero. You were 26 at Utah State, so why zero here? Yeah, so I was actually 87 all growing up. Um, played receiver just through Little League in high school. I was 87. And um, zero, uh, I came from Orem, so, and I just wanted to be a little bit different because no one really wore zero here yet as a DB, so just wanted to be that one. Confidence-wise, you personally... What's your confidence level like after that last game? Um, I, I feel the same. Uh, just got to treat every game like it's the same. I'm not going to go in any more confident than I was the game or just before. So in terms of preparation, you guys went through so much in the off season to learn this new scheme and to get ready. Because of all the preparation that you went through in the off season, is that why we saw such a great defensive performance? Was that all done in the off season? Yeah, our off season was very long this year. Had a lot to learn, had a lot to uh, figure out. And I think just um, us practicing every day and just going so hard has helped us. When you look at the game in week one, what do you take from that game that you want to carry over, not just to week two, but throughout the season? Uh, I think just how well our defense tackled. Um, I feel like our keys were pretty on point. We were really uh, communicating. Well, I want to definitely take our communication into the season. When you talk about communication, what do you mean? Um, If you see a formation and you think you know the play, let everyone know around you. Um, Certain alignments, you might get a certain route, so let everyone know. It just helps. What do you know about Southern Utah, this team that played Arizona State pretty well? So what do you know about their offense? Uh, They're going to run it a lot. Um, Of course, they'll pass on long distance down, so do a lot of switch releases and, yeah. Not that you would take anybody lightly, but does it help that they did give Arizona State a bit of a game and and had chances to win that? Does that help you not overlook an FCS team like Southern Utah? Yes, for sure. I feel like people think that we're just going to go into this game like, oh, it's it's a win. But no, we still got to treat it like we're playing Alabama, like we're playing Texas. So, Where do you feel that you guys, granted, just one week? still need to get better defensively because everyone wants to talk about the shutout and how well you guys played. I know there's still room that you guys feel for improvement. Where is that? I think all around. um, We had five missed tackles. If we could get zero missed tackles, that'd be perfect. There's always room for improvement. Um, If I were to choose, no catch balls on anybody. Um, All right, let's get to the personality questions. We're going to get to the final four. What is your favorite ice cream flavor, and when was the last time you had it? Uh, Vanilla. It's definitely my favorite. Uh, Last time I had it, probably, let's say, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Okay, so are you straight vanilla, or is it vanilla with, like, toppings, that kind of stuff? So I'll put, like, I don't know if you know what the little mochi things are. Yeah. Yeah, I'll put those on, um, sometimes caramel, and, yeah, that's about it. Cherries, a lot of cherries, but. You're only allowed to subscribe to one streaming service. You have to pick one. Which one streaming service are you going to subscribe to? Like a YouTube? Yeah, I get like a Netflix or any oh. any of the ones that you have to pay for the streaming service. There's so many out there, but you can only pick one. Which one are you picking? Does Xbox Live count? Sure, I'll, I'll go with that. I'll do Xbox Live. So are you a big gamer then? Do you do you spend a lot of time when you're not preparing for football? Um, not during season, I don't game that much. But a little bit like right after season. Off season, I don't game as much either, but it's right after Okay, are you a dog person or a cat person? Dog, for sure. I have a dog right now, yeah. What kind of dog do you have? A German Shepherd Husky. Boy, girl? Boy. Uh, Name? Zero. Oh, 
I like it. Yeah. So how so how long have you had zero? Uh, he's like six months old. So we're like, are you the doggy dad? You're doing the whole thing here? Yeah, I, I get help from my roommates, but he's not living at my house right now. We have some friends watching him, so. Okay. All right, last question. What does it mean to you to be a part of BYU's first P5 season heading into the Big 12? Um, it means everything. Um, I grew up watching BYU, um, independent, everything, Mountain West. So I think it's just cool to be become like kind of history. Jacob, thank you so much. Uh, congratulations on a great performance in week one, and uh, good luck in week two. Thank you. That was BYU cornerback Jacob Robinson, quite the debut in 2023 for the Orem native. And again, getting a shout out from Maria Osmond after game one. Let's let's it's royalty right there. Come on, man. You can't beat that. You can't I would kill. I got retweeted one time from Donnie Osmond. And I thought I had, like that is the best. The two the two biggest retweets. I want to ask you this question. Oh. The two biggest retweets or likes I've ever had in my life. Donnie Osmond, mm-hmm. vanilla ice. Oh, those are good. Those are good. <laughs> What, what what Rob? What did he retweet or or mention? BYU baseball was having a '90s night, and so like everything was like '90s music, and so I tweeted out, "Hey, come out to Miller Park tonight! BYU baseball with a '90s night. There better be a ton of vanilla ice." Oh, I love it! And he liked it. Oh, yeah, nice. So yeah, me and Rob that. Van Winkle, we're tight. Well, I remember when Donnie Osmond came out to give Jake Heap some advice, so that was a good time. <laughs> yes, it was. All right, you're going to hear more from Hans coming up on the other side. We're going to let him flex his uh, analyst uh, muscles. We're going to break down BYU's offensive miscues from week one in X's and Olsen. It's coming your way next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America. On the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Alongside Hans Olsen, here's Jason Shepard. We're outside Lavelle Edwards Stadium out in Cougar Canyon hanging out. If you're going to be uh, coming to the game today and you're walking around, stop by and say hello, Shep and Hans. Hans just gave away a signed football. We've got one more to give away before pregame is over. Okay, so let's talk about this because we got three huge young BYU fans that are front and center, okay. and we ran a competition amongst the three. They're all strapping, handsome young men. They're all intelligent. The questions were fairly simple. They did a very good job. I asked, greatest quarterback all time, BYU history. Now, obviously, it's objective. I got Zach Wilson out of one of the young men. I said, greatest running back all time, BYU history. I got Jamal Williams out of the crowd. So some really good answers. And one of these young men ended up winning the football that's signed by Kalani Sataki, Jay Hill, Aaron Roderick, Greg Rubel, and Did I see you sign it? No, no. Here, okay, here's, this is embarrassing. He didn't ask me to. I just took it and signed it. I, and then he was like, hey, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I, I figured. It's like, I didn't want to say anything. They've actually asked for a different ball that hasn't been signed. <laughs> they hand that in. I don't know what this haunts. What is this haunts? What, what is, I can't even read this. <laughs> is he a German football player? <laughs> no, it's awesome. And it's so fun to see the fans out here. They're so great, Shep. This is so much fun. It is a lot of fun. Uh, what was not necessarily so fun last week was the, the miscues on the offensive side. And we have both said we fully expect that to be remedied and to have a much better, yeah. uh, significantly better performance today. But in this week's X's and Olsen, you kind of broke down exactly what was going on. Okay, let's do it this way. Okay. Let's start biggest problem to least. Okay. And we're going to go position groups. Okay. Okay. Biggest problem, number one, wide receivers. Their sets and their blocks. Getting set finding their blocks because you wanted to do so many things on the outside. Obviously, Aaron Roddick and Slovis wanted to pass the ball last week against Sam Houston. It was obvious. So they lined up four wides. They lined up in bunch sets, which is essentially just three receivers on one side more grouped up. You can go a trip set, which is a little bit more separated, and a bunch set is trips, but a little bit more grouped up. They ran a trip set. There was a little more spread. They did all kinds of – they ran all kinds of different formations. They also ran uh, 12 personnel, 13 personnel, and 14 personnel. That means one running back and two tight ends, or one running back and three tight ends, and one running back and four tight ends in, at times. They wanted to pass the ball. So first and foremost, it's receiver issues. Getting lined up. If you can't line up, there's no way you can execute a play. If it's taking you time to figure out what my depth is, am I on the line, am I off the line? Am I two yards inside the Y or am I three yards inside the Y receiver? If you can't line up, 
you can't execute the play. And the tough thing about it, Shep, whether it's Sam Houston or Southern Utah, the corner that's standing in front of you as a receiver is a Division I athlete. They're a Division I athlete. Whether it's Division One FCS or it was their first year in FBS last week against Sam Houston, they're Division One. These guys are fast, they're smart, they're aggressive, and they're trying to win this game. So if you can't line up and your job is to block that corner and you're worried about your separation from the wide receiver, I'm not going to block you. So get lined up, know your target, and pick it up. It's that simple. Okay. And then I think you're going to see some of those outside pop passes that should break to the outside and go get you at 15 yards from time to time, unlike anything that happened against Sam Houston. So number one was wide receivers. Number two, offensive line. There's just in, – in zone blocking schemes, there's going to be leaks. I am not Trevor Maddich upset about offensive line play because I went through individual sets. If I lumped it all together, I could almost get that angry, but not quite. Trevor was really upset. And, and I get it because he's a perfectionist. He played perfect yep. offensive line, and he's a perfectionist. So I totally get it. But I thought there were some really good performances, and that's why I put them second to the receivers. Okay. All you got to do is just stop the zone leaks and be able to stop the twist. Zone blocking concepts in a pass set are supposed to make it easier to pick up twists than man concepts in twists and stunts. I, 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 I'll try to make that a little bit more sense for people out there. So if I'm, a, if I'm an offensive guard and I'm an offensive tackle, we have a zoned area. So mm-hmm. if people twist and come around and start going in front of my face, well, that's my zone. I pick them yeah. up. If I'm a man and all of a sudden my man goes to the outside and I'm on a man and I'm turning for my man, I have to be able to punch that guy and then I've got to be able to re-switch a man that's coming in right. front of me. You've got to so, be able to do two things at it, the same time. Exactly. So zone concepts are supposed to make twist and stunts a little bit more manageable. That wasn't the case against Sam Houston for one reason or the other. So they just need to calm it down a little bit. And really, it goes to Kingsley. So not the uh, Kingsley mm-hmm. has got to be the leader of that offensive front. Calm it down, and Kingsley can get things going. Then we're going to go number three. We're going to go to the tight ends. Tight ends, I felt like could block a little better and could catch a little bit better, and and could be a little bit more functional in their movement blocks. And then we're going to go to running backs. Running backs could be a little bit better. And by the way, I just want you to know, I'm conditioned to never blame an, a, court, a quarterback. That's it. I'm just conditioned. It's just, just not going to happen. I'm conditioned. Not uh, on my watch. They force you as an offensive lineman. Don't you ever blame a quarterback. <laughs> They're the prettiest, most important thing on a team. So I'm going to go to the running backs. Aiden Robbins can be a little bit better. And then I'm going to go to Slovis. Get the ball out. I want to see Slovis release. Release. Here's the deal, Shep. It's hard to release a ball when receivers aren't setting in their routes. Get it set, get in your route so Slovis can really pass this ball. But that's my order, one through whatever, to get through the problems you had against Sam Houston. Great. All, all fixable. All, yes, that's, and I think that's the key. Nothing was so bad that it can't be fixed in a very short period of time. All fixable. Yes. That's and, f- and I'm demanding on this day, September the ninth, thank you. Yes. On this day, September the ninth, I am demanding that this offense get fixed because y- you've got the personnel, y- you've got the bodies. Yeah, there's no excuse if they can't get aligned. Oh, it doesn't matter what kind of body you got. Get them aligned. Get those running backs aligned. They've got the bodies. They've got the speed. They've got the work ethic. They can produce, and they will today. I love it. That's X's and Olsen. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll take you around the Big 12 Conference. There might be a game that Cougar fans are paying a little bit of attention to going on right now, and here's a little tease. You may be pretty happy right now. We'll go over all that. The Big 12 Blitz coming up next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Let's get you back to Jason Shepard and Hans Olsen for more Cougar Pregame Live. Brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Week two of the 2023 BYU football season. Cougars back at home looking to start the season 2-0. They've got Southern Utah here at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. Hans Olsen and Jason Shepard with you here just, uh, just to the west of Lavelle Edwards Stadium out in Cougar Canyon. The crowd still going strong. It's time now for our Big 12 Blitz segment. We'll 
take you around the Big 12 Conference. And right now, uh, I would imagine that uh, most of the country is probably watching number 12 Utah at Baylor. I certainly know people here at Cougar Canyon are watching it because they've got it on the screen over here. And Baylor picked up a huge pass play a minute ago, and this place went nuts. <laughs> and uh, your, your score at the half in Waco, Baylor leading Utah 10-3. So a touchdown advantage for the Baylor Bears at halftime. Okay, so imagine taking a bear, putting it in a cage, yeah. getting a shock a shock uh, stick, and just sitting there and hitting the cage irons and throwing it at the bear. That's what happened last week to Baylor yeah. when they lost to Texas State. And I promise you, Dave Aranda is a defensive-minded mastermind. I promise you they went back to the drawing board and they're like, I am not going to lose my job because I'm giving up 42 points to Texas State. We are going to go out there. We're going to play better defense. And right now they've held Utah to just three points. So Baylor is putting on a pretty good performance, an inspired performance in 105-degree temperatures with 38% humidity. It's a pretty rough environment to play. Be honest with you. Now, obviously, we don't play Baylor this year. So we're not sure when BYU football is going back to Waco. In that scenario, whenever that game goes, are you going to be more excited to go down to the game itself or to the Don't Chip say and Joe Joe's. Joe's. Don't Ch- say Chip Joe and, Joe's. Chip and Joe. Come Don't on. make me choose between uh, <laughs> Chip and Joe Joe. Here, you go Chip and Joe the day before the game, then you go to the game the next day, and it's quite the ex- excursion. About two weeks ago, I had a dream that I woke up right in the middle of with this big smile because I shared a ham sandwich with Chip. What? Yes, it was a it was a cheddar cheese and ham sandwich with extra mayo, and he brought it in because we were about to do some demo work on a house, and he's like, "You want half my sandwich?" And I sat down. I'm like, and I woke up. I was up. I was pumped, man. I shared a sandwich with Chip. Uh, okay, fine, fine. You're making me choose. Yes, cheers. I'm going Magnolia. Oh, Chip and Joe, Joe. Okay, here's a little something. It was set up. Chip was coming here and was going to be on the BYU TV pregame show, oh, and then it didn't work out for him to come. Uh, he was been, almost here. It would have been insane. Does Chip <laughs> understand that the 65,000 people that stack this stadium are his people? Like his kind of people? Like, oh, does my he, gosh. Does he know that uh, every one of us thinks he is one of us? Look, uh, if he doesn't, he should. He and it should. will be known very soon. Because this place loves him. All right, your halftime score, Baylor, is leading number 12, Utah, 10-3. The only other game going on right now featuring a Big 12 team is in Manhattan, Kansas, number 15, K-State, with a 21-10 to lead at the half over Troy. And, I mean, I mean we, I don't think we expect anything major coming from this one other than K-State to continue to, uh, to roll in this one. Yeah, they should. Uh, the one I'm looking at... Shep is Iowa State taking on Iowa. That's going to be a yep. really big game, and that could be a big win for the Big 12. If you can go out and get Iowa after the damage that they did to Utah State, they look good. Even though Utah State had a chance in that game, that would be a really nice win for Iowa State. Well, and you've got uh, a little bit later on some big, big games. Uh, probably the biggest is number three, Alabama, and number 11, Texas. Uh, that game will be on ESPN at 5 o'clock Mountain Time. And then this is a really interesting one, Hans. Number 13, Oregon at Texas Tech. We were all stunned when the Red Raiders went into lovely Laramie, Wyoming, and yeah. lost in double overtime in week one. Now you're bringing in the 13th-ranked Oregon Ducks. There's a real chance if Texas Tech can't play a much better game, they're going to start the season 0-2. Yeah, they're probably going to start at 0-2. And And outside of that Utah-Baylor matchup, there are two other Pac-12, Big 12 matchups. There are three Pac-12, Big 12 matchups. And you obviously want to see the Big 12 get get the advantage in those Pac-12 matchups. If Texas Tech could sneak it out against Oregon, that'd be great. But I'm insisting that Oklahoma State get the win against Arizona State in the nightcap. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be good. You've got other other matchups, UCF, uh, about six hours north up in Boise, taking on Boise State. Uh, Houston will be at Rice, so it's a, it's a battle of the, uh, the teams from the Houston area. Uh, TCU and Nichols, I would imagine TCU finally evens that record up after falling to, to Colorado in week one. They should beat Nichols. And then, as you mentioned, the, the late-night game, uh, Oklahoma State at Arizona State, really good uh, slate of uh, Big 12 games today. Yeah, it is. It's a nice slate and an opportunity to make some real noise nationally. Look, Baylor could start it. If they can find a way to get that win, Baylor could start the noise. That's a huge Big 12 win if they can polish that thing off. But outside of that, 
Steve Sarkeesian. Yep. Boy, Steve. His old team, too. Two stints at Alabama as their offensive coordinator. That's right. He had a short stint in it, it with Atlanta in between the two stints, but two times he was out at Alabama with Nick Saban calling those games. Now he's got to go to Tuscaloosa and try to take on his old mentor. It's going to be a great one. Oh, it would be so good to see Texas come out of a win. Please let that happen. Yeah, there, we'll, we will certainly be following that game uh, and uh, many others throughout the, uh, throughout the broadcast today. Uh, we will take a quick break. When we come back, we will visit with the voice, the voice of the Cougars. Greg Rubel is here, and we will talk to him about today's matchup. When we return, this is Mountain America Cougar Pregame Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Alongside Hans Olsen, here's Jason Shepard. You guys really need to be here live watching Hans. This guitar riff is just amazing. It's fantastic. (laughs) And the fact that he does it so perfectly every single time back in, is, I think it speaks to his greatness. A lot of practice, man. I don't come unprepared with anything. <laughs> well, we like it. Welcome back in. BYU Southern Utah it is week two of the season. Cougars looking to uh, get things on the right track in terms of the offense. And uh, there's a chance that they may be getting one of those weapons that can help out with that. We'll welcome in the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel, to our broadcast location. Hello, Greg. How are you? Hey, Hello, boss. Jason. Hello. Hello, Hans. How are you? I'm well. Very Good. well. It's a game day. It is a game day. Oh, and it's it's not even high noon yet, and we are deep into this. I love it. Well, and uh, I mentioned that uh, BYU may be getting a weapon. Who knows? Maybe more. You've talked with yeah. Kalani. What's the latest on the offensive side in terms of personnel? Yeah, Keanu Hill sat out last week. Will go today. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he's in the starting group. If they start three wide, I, I think he could even be out there to start the game. Uh, Cody Epps, a uh, little fist bump in the end zone a minute ago as he warmed up. He's here. He's dressed. He will warm up. Not sure that he'll be going today. I think officially uh, Kalani called him game time with me. Uh, and, and so uh, Cody getting closer. But uh, I think all things considered, um, if BYU plays the game, kind of game they hope to play today and they get Keanu back and everyone else plays just a little bit better than last week, this could be another week for Cody to, to get healthier for Fayetteville next week when the games, not that these don't count, but they start to matter a lot more when you start that run of 10 straight P5s next weekend. And so uh, Cody officially game time decision. Keanu is good to go. That's really the only thing you're looking at uh, from a personnel standpoint. They, they got out of game one, I thought, pretty healthy. Uh, nothing really to worry about uh, on either side of the ball beyond guys that were already out, you know, Hank Liropati and, and, and people like that. Uh, you hope to get Talon Afri back at some point. Won't be today. So, yeah, I think all things considered, pretty good for week one. Um, I, w- I will note this, uh, and it may not be noted by people, but uh, Kelly Papinga, who is the defensive ends coach and special teams coordinator, is not with the team today at this hour in California are the funeral services for his nephew, Julius, Brady Papinga's son and Kelly's nephew. And so uh, Kelly is where he needs to be today uh, with his family uh, for that. And so the coaches will band together and and do Kelly's job uh, while he attends to that. And we'll have Coach Papinga back uh, for next week. And we wish him all the love and and uh, and and uh, consolation that he and his family will accept at this time as they uh, deal with that uh, – that death in their family of someone so young and vital, and, and uh, it's been weighing a lot of people's minds now for uh, more than a week, and, and today will be that day. You know, we didn't talk enough about this, Greg, and I want you to talk a little bit about it because I know you have talked to the coaches and talked to some of the players. There was a heavier heart yeah. last week than I think was really explained. Yeah, in, in the effort to get ready for your season opener, uh, the players and coaches and program dealt with two deaths. Uh, two passings. Uh, one was of Julius in the middle of, or the early part of game week, who is Brady's son and Kelly's nephew, and the Papinga family is so tight to BYU. And then on game day, you had Matabatase uh, lose his father that morning, the morning of game day. And and I, I heard that that that, that the walkthrough, the, the the typical game day stuff that a, that an offense would go through, didn't feel right. It was just off, and 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 not that it was going to be used as any kind of excuse after the fact, but there was a represent. A, 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 a true reflection back on the day and how things were just a little off for a lot of guys and expectedly off that day, including one Mataba Taase, uh, who, who suffered the loss personally that was out there in the early stages of the game, hands making plays, uh, doing his best to shake off 
uh, the heaviness of his heart and go do his job as a tight end that was involved in a lot of packages last week. So, yes, it was part of last week. And, again, not solely responsible for anything. But in the human element, it has to be considered. Go ahead, Hans. Anybody out there that thinks that there is not an element to that and thinks it's football, toughen up, go out there and do your job, you're out of your mind. You can't take it out of your mind. I've lost teammates in the middle of the season. One teammate that we lost to a brain tumor went down really quick, three weeks, and we lost him, and it destroyed the season. We, we never could come back together. Terrence Harvey, who we lost here at BYU back in 97, I think it was, just a young kid, three BYU players driving in a car, and it rolled, and we lost one in the season. It, it took four or five weeks until we felt like our team could move past it. Hmm. Until everybody was grieved, not healed, but ready to say, okay, football is important. Because it's a, it's a shock to the world, to your world. It's like, well, what's important? Well, what's important? My dad's important. Why was I here practicing? Why was I not fishing with him? Why was I not playing with him? Why was I not at the movies with him? Why am I wasting time with a stupid football game? And it takes a minute to refocus yourself and say, wait, what would my dad want? He would want me to be out here and be successful. And it's hard to get your mind back to that part of the game. Yeah. And for today, uh, certainly uh, Kalani and his coaches wanted Kelly to be where Kelly is today. And again, uh, condolences to the Papingas and the Taases. There will be obvious, tangible things to look at to see that the offense uh, is taking its step forward here in week two points, obviously. One of them, you know, trying to look at the scores, certainly more than the 14 we saw last week. What does a better offensive performance beyond just the obvious tangible things look like to you today? Well, well, nearly doubling up your yards per play. It was a very low number last week uh, for BYU, and and it was was in the fours, the low fours, and you want to be – you want to be much better than that. And against an FCS opponent, I don't think that asking to nearly double that is, is too much to ask. Now, it's, it's, again, one thing I would look at is yards per play. If it's not, if it's not near eight, it has to be better than what it was last week. Um, and, and so that would be one for me. Drive efficiency, you can't argue with the efficiency because every time they got inside the 20 last week, they scored two touchdowns on two drives. You just want to be there a lot more frequently, and they weren't. Uh, I think Kansas has punted, at least at the end of the third quarter last night, Kansas had punted one time through a game. Did they punt more than once last night? I, I don't remember, yeah. Anyway, but yes. They, yeah, so bring down the punt number. As much as we love Ryan Rico and the Rico Rockets, we want to see fewer of them today. And so uh, punt less, keep the high, the drive efficiency where it was, and, and, and really bump up that yards per play number. Now, Southern Utah was impressive in a lot of ways. Uh, at Arizona State last week, scored 21. Uh, they were they were a big play team, so there were there were a handful of big plays there, and one including that came back on a personal foul. So they can do some things. Uh, notably, uh, the wide receiver Isaiah Wooden. Uh, keep an eye out for him. He's a speedster, big play guy on the outside. Uh, Targi Lampson. I was talking with Jan Jorgensen in pregame, and he coached Targi at Snow, where he was a JUCO All-American. He scored last week at Arizona State. They really do like the right tackle, Austin Laousa, uh who uh, looked at home against the P5 opponent last week so a lot of things to like about southern utah which again scored 21 uh byu didn't allow a single point last week we know how tough it is to record back-to-back shutouts but i know the defense will be going in today going let's do another one that's where i wanted to go next um i would ask the question do you have all the back-to-back shutout numbers ready but i know the answer to that uh shep i'm going to take you behind the scenes just just a little bit during last week's broadcast you know the clock is ticking down there's a zero on the board and I said to Ralph, hey, Ralph, do you have shutout numbers? Greg turns a paper towards me, and it looked like war and peace. <laughs> he, he had like 650 references of BYU shutouts and who and how and, and looked at me like, don't ever. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> don't ever question anything statistically ever. <laughs> no, I, I lean on Ralph as much as Hans was ready to, believe me. But uh, It was po- awesome. Post-World War II, they've had two sets of back-to-back shutouts, so they're hard to do. They're, they're very, hard to do. Yeah. very hard to do, but, yeah. but chances... Is it possible? Well, right? it's an FCS team. You should expect, I mean, the average number of points allowed in 17 FCS games that BYU's played has been 10. All right, so it never gets too high, and it's been single digits on a lot of those games. And, in fact, the last shutout that BYU had before last week was against an FCS opponent back in 2014. So, yeah, if you were trying to get back-to-back shutouts, this would be a golden opportunity. 
Greg, thank you so much for the update yep. on the personnel and certainly your insights. Hans, awesome job in the first hour. We'll let both of you go, and we'll hear you in about 30 minutes. Thank you, Shep. Thank you. There we go. Give, that's right. Give them a hand. Hans and Greg, they'll be uh, making their way up to the press box and get ready for more uh, pregame coverage coming up in about 30 minutes. Coming up next, however, our sideline reporter, Mitchell Jurgens. You know him. You love him. He's here, and he'll join me on the other side. But first, let's pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is BYU football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is BYU Radio on KBYU FM HD2 Provo. You're listening to BYU football on BYU Radio. Let's get you back to Jason Shepard and Hans Olsen for more Cougar Pregame Live. Brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Inside an hour. From kickoff here at Lavelle Edwards Stadium, BYU and Southern Utah. This will be the second home game in a row to start the season for the Cougars. Next week on the road at Arkansas. But no worrying about the Razorbacks right now. All focus on the T-Birds of Southern Utah. Welcome back in. This is Mountain America Cougar pregame live. Mountain America is the official credit union of BYU Athletics. And as I mentioned, joining me here in our broadcast booth out here in Cougar Canyon is Mitchell Jurgens. Mitch, looking good in the Navy today. Hey, thanks. I'm uh, I'm actually a big fan of the Navy. Um, I, the I Navy, the color or the the armed forces? Uh, both. Okay, very I mean, nice. I mean, well played. My, you know, I was, I was meaning the color, but uh, you, you set it up so nicely. So, <laughs> it, uh, of course, both. But uh, I love the Navy look. Yeah. And they're going to go with the uh, with a, a Navy helmet, but a different Navy helmet than what we've seen the last couple of times that BYU's worn the Navy uh, uniforms. They've gone with a matte Navy finish, which for anybody that follows me, so I, I'm a sucker for a matte finish. I wish all helmets were matte finish as opposed to the glossy. That's just me. But uh, I, I'm with you. I, I Certainly, I love the Royal, and I, that's certainly where this is all going yeah. eventually. But uh, but I, I don't I don't mind mixing in the Navy. It's a nice look. No, I, I love mixing it up. I think that's what these players want too. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the different combinations. They love it. Yeah, the kids love those things, right? All right, let's talk about the offense. It really has been the the story. Uh, the last week is what to expect from the offense bouncing back. So, as somebody that's been on the field on that side of the ball as a receiver, when the offense sputters like we saw last week. What's the next week's prep like from a player's standpoint, trying to work through those things? Yeah, the, the number one thing is you've, you've got to get in the film room and, and you've got to, you, you have to review the film over and over again. Not just as an individual, but you've got to, you've got to review it as a team. Uh, as an offense, you need to review it with your position group. Um, there's a number of situations where you know, you're coming off the field and, and if you're just communicating with your quarterback to say, hey, we were, you know, this is my perspective, a quarterback may have a different perspective, you get in the film room, you can all get on the same page. Um, you've got to do that. I work in uh, I work in tech sales, and we use a tool that records all of our Zoom calls. So if something goes wrong, the biggest resource for us is you know go back, listen to the call, identify what went wrong, what you know what could we have changed or tweak at certain in certain aspects of that call to make it better and put ourselves in a better position. Um, and and that's exactly what this this offense needs to do. They need to get back into the film room, um, study the film, do their best to uh, you know dissect what went wrong, make plans to change. Um, and then obviously apply that through practice moving forward. Um, the second thing that I do want to see is I, I, I didn't get a sense of a player out there last week who was ready to, to make the big splash or the big play. I, that's 100% a mentality thing. You've got to come into that game mentally preparing yourself. Like, in, you know, when it's third down, I'm going to be the one that's vocal on the field. It's like, hey, get me the ball. I'm going to make a big play. We didn't see a lot of that last week. Um, so I, I fully expect them to start doing that. You've got to have, you know, one of those uh, spark plugs on the offense to be that person um, to, to kind of just get out of the sputters like you mentioned last week. So when the coaches talked about miscues, that was kind of the word, The miscommun- several miscommunications, they talked about that. Kalani talked about it after the game. They talked about it this week. As a former receiver, what would cause that after seemingly having so much time in the offseason – to, to get on the same page, what, what would cause in game one to s- still have those miscommunications? Yeah, that, t- to be honest, Jason, it's a hard question to answer because, in, in my opinion, 
at the D1 level, that should not happen consistently. Even if it's a week one, you've got to come out ready to go. Now, I'm not sure what the issue was, uh, but to answer your question, right, you know, what, what could cause that, um, number one, potentially just the lack of preparation or understanding of the current game script. Uh, back when I played every single week, you know, we had a, a massive list and, and big playbook that we'd pull from, but every single week, based on what the defense was doing, we would get a script that was your plays most likely to be run um, in certain situations, and um, you've got to you, you've understand those plays, review it, you know, memorize it like the back of your hand. You know every single situation that most of those plays are being called, and if you're not reviewing that or, or um, you know, becoming familiar with it, then yes, there's going to be some miscommunications because um, maybe everybody has again another a different perspective on what they should be doing in each and every play um the second thing is if if, you know at times you're going to get different coverages and and as a receiver what's what's challenging is you're not just you've got a route and your route looks the exact same for every single different coverage um, depending on what the coverage looks like, you've got to alter your routes. You've got to tweak them. You've got to, you know, is it, is it, am I running out against man or I'm sitting in a zone hole? Um, those are all different scenarios, which if you're not prepared or ready for those when they come, that can cause those miscommunications. Um, and then, you know, the last thing, and I know this has been talked about, there's just a lot of newness on the offense. New quarterback, three new offensive linemen, new receivers, new running backs, um, a lot of pre-snap motion. This is, it's challenging. Um, if you don't know, again, you know, you don't, uh, it's not second nature to you because you're all just learning it. When you get into a stadium with 60,000 fans, um, energy is, is just at a whole new level that you're not used to in practice. You're then, you, you can't think as fast on your feet. So then you fall to the level of your preparation. And if it's not that second nature, you know, I know exactly where to be or what to do, then you do have to think. And at times you can't think that fast out on the field. So that, that could be a potential issue as well. I, the, the exciting thing is, we all expect the offense to not have the same issues today. We all expect a significantly uh, improved offense. And quite frankly, I think we expect to see sort of an angry offense. Like, they, they knew they didn't play great last week, and they, they all admitted that afterwards. So I expect to see a very um, motivated and fierce offense today. Hey, 100%. I mean, I, I fully expect Aaron Roderick, and, and we did it after last week. The play calling seemed to be a little bit vanilla, right? There wasn't too much going on. There weren't too many downfield concepts. Yeah, Keaton threw, you know, a couple deep balls. Never connected on any of them. He was 0 for 5 on deep balls, which, you know, again, receivers need to step up. There needs to be that chemistry between the quarterback and the receiver. Uh, But there just wasn't too much flash or aggression, it seemed like, with the play calling. I fully expect that to change with Aaron Roderick tonight. He wants to make a statement. These players want to make a statement. They don't like, you know, what what everybody's talking about about this BYU offense. They want to change that, and I'm sure we'll see it tonight. The defense last week was fantastic, and it was a really good debut to come out after, you know, new coaches and new schemes. That was fun to see. From what we saw in that performance, what is sustainable moving forward week after week? Yeah, n- number one is effort. One thing I absolutely loved from this defensive effort last week is they, they swarmed to the football. Um, you know, uh, you heard uh, Jacob Robbins talk about he wants to see – yeah, they had five missed tackles. That needs to improve. That's not that bad, right? They actually tackled pretty well, and it was all – everybody was in pursuit. You didn't see too many players standing around looking for the next guy to make the play. Um, I love the collective effort, the teamwork effort from that defense to rally to the football and finish the play, yeah. uh, which which was spectacular. And that you can expect week after week. Um, the second thing is I, I, I do love Jay Hill's play calling. It was aggressive. There were a number of quarterback hurries. Um, only got to the quarterback, o- only one sack, I believe. Um, but I, I, I fully expect that to you know evolve week after week as, as he continues to stay aggressive. Um, I think this defense, I mean, we can count on them. Um, it, it, and what's, what's neat about that is, and, and the reason why I think you can stay aggressive is the, the fabulous cornerback play. Um, yeah, it was great. it was incredible. It, it, they're they're putting themselves in a position where you can trust them on an island. You can get more creative at the line of scrimmage to bring pressure, uh, make opposing quarterbacks uncomfortable. That's what I loved, and I think again that mentality, the play calling, the aggression that can stay um, consistent week after week. What do you expect today? There's there's no looking ahead to Arkansas. It's all about Southern Utah. What type of game do you expect today? Yeah, uh, I mean we kind of talked about big bounce back from the offense. A lot of that just with the energy that they bring. Um, talked about, you know, Aaron Rodgers' play calling. I expect that same fire from the players as well. Um, we need to see 
guy step up, make, uh, step up and make plays. I love to hear that uh, uh, Keanu Hill is back. Yeah, um, that's a great veteran. News. That's a veteran player that has done this. He's you know r- caught for over a thousand yards in his career here at BYU. He's he, he can be potentially that spark plug to get the offense going. Um, so big bounce back from the offense, and honestly. I expect the defense to continue to do what they did. Um, I saw enough last week where I was very impressed. They've got talent. I think the coaches know how to utilize that talent. Um, so, you know, I'm expecting seven or less points uh, against uh, against this defense. And I do. I want to see 35, 40, 40 plus. Um, I think that they're, they're very much capable and uh, just excited to see what, what they produce on the field today. Great stuff, Mitch. Appreciate it as always. Did you bring your sunscreen? You got sunscreen today? I've got it. Nice. Yep. Prepared. Were you an Eagle Scout? I was. That's why, that's why he has it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Mitchell Jurgens. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. All right. On the other side, my conversation with T-Bird head coach Delane Fitzgerald. That's next on Mountain America Credit Union Cougar pregame live on the new skid, BYU Sports Network. You're tuned to Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, back to Jason Shepard. BYU and Southern Utah. These two teams have not played each other since uh, back in 2016. I mentioned this to start the broadcast. To put that into perspective, Taysom Hill was the quarterback of the BYU Cougars the last time these two teams faced each other. This is Cougar Pregame Live. It is brought to you by Mountain America. And earlier this week, I was able to talk with the head coach of the Southern Utah Thunderbirds. His name is Delane Fitzgerald. I really enjoyed this conversation. And I asked him what he learned about his team in their close loss to Arizona State. We learned that we're, we will keep playing. We, we learned that the guys are, are going to, no matter what happens to them, good or bad, we're going to tee it up and learn from it and play the next play. And we learned that we have some resilience. We also learned that we can take a two-hour and 20-minute break and still come out and play well. Let's talk about your offense because you return a lot of production, including your quarterback, your running back, your top two receivers. How much has that helped that side of the ball hit the ground running, do you think? If you return good players, Your offense is usually going to be better offense, defense, and special teams. When you return good players, you're going to be good the following year in that area. Now, if you're just returning ordinary or bad players, it usually doesn't get much better. I do want to ask you specifically about Mataava Taasi, who who played for you last year, and he shot up the depth chart here at BYU, and Cougar fans are still getting to know him. What were your impressions of him while, while he was with you in Cedar City? I yeah, thought thought he was a nice young man, um, worked reasonably hard, and, and thought he was a uh, thought he was a good player. What type of team did you think you have, and then what did you see in game one? Any differences in what maybe you thought you had versus what you're seeing now? Our coaching staff likes our football team, and it's taken us 18 months to get to this point. Uh, we inherited a football program that wasn't very good here 18 months ago, and, and, and we've slowly but surely. Uh, gotten better each day and our coaching staff and our players our strength and conditioning program everything's improved each day we've been here we like our football program if we can get in and out of Provo on Saturday healthy we've got a shot to be a pretty good FCS program your defense seems to be anchored by the experience at linebacker and you brought in some guys in the secondary and up front how do you view the defensive side of the ball in 2023 our front seven is really good. Our front seven is really good. And we've got two defensive ends we like and four D tackles we like. And then we've got four linebackers that rotate all in, usually about equal plays, and we like them. We've had to revamp our DB position, and we're hoping that it'll hold up through Saturday. Um, but but our DB position, we didn't like what we had last year. And then, just frankly, not quality young men and not not quality students and not quality players. Um, so they're all on somebody else's roster now. And, and we've got what, five out of the six DBs that are in the rotation right now are new to our football program and doing a nice job. You mentioned a minute ago, you know, you came in and you had some work to do sort of molding this team into what you want. Is that a process you enjoy? Because I know it's a lot of work, but I've got to assume that as a coach, that's kind of the fun of it, isn't it? It became my reputation as an assistant coach, and every job I got was was a turnaround project, a rebuild, a, a resurrection project, 
Um, I was uh, just real quickly. I was I was at James Madison and recruited the team that uh, helped recruit the team that won the 2004 national title. Out of that, I got a coordinator's job at UT Martin, and they hadn't had a winning season since uh, 1988. And we went there and turned it around in three seasons and took the coordinator's job at Bethel University. And then had a winning season since 2000, uh, since 1933. And, and we had a winning season there the first season we were at. Um, Southern Virginia University had never had a winning season when we got there. And we had two there and then took over that Frostburg job. And they hadn't had a winning season in 15 years. And we managed to win 60-some games in six years. Um, I'm convinced that's how I got the job here. Um, that they had averaged one win a year for the previous four years before we got here, and, and now we're trying to fix things. Um, almost there. Give me your thoughts on this BYU team. They're coming off a victory, but by all accounts, nobody feels good, especially on the offensive side. They're, they're looking for big improvement. What stands out to you about this BYU team? Yeah, a lot, a lot of Cougar fans and alumni that are restless. Um, more, more people have reached out to me in the last 48 hours from another team's alumni base and fan base than ever in my career. Um, and some of the comments and emails and text messages are interesting. Um, the Facebook posts are interesting. But yeah, I, I know you guys are uneasy. Kalani Sataki is a solid head coach, and he's going to figure it out. Aaron Roderick has proved over the years that he's more than a good offensive coordinator, and he'll figure it out this week. They, they looked really, really bad on film. They looked so bad on film the other night against Sam Houston that it makes you uncomfortable because you know you're not getting that performance two games in a row. And, and then Jay Hill's defenses look like Jay Hill's defenses look. We expect the same defense and same special teams from them with a much improved offense. You, you brought it up earlier. We're excited about how we played and how we did against Arizona State. But we're well aware that the football team we play this Saturday at lunchtime is much better than Arizona State. This will be the first time that these two teams have met since 2016, and this will be your first matchup against the Cougars. What does this game mean to your team, which obviously features a lot of in-state players? Yeah, th this, this matchup should never happen. And you want a good laugh. We keep signing up to play Utah, Arizona State, BYU. The strength conditioning slash nutrition budget at those school, those three schools is more than we it individually is more than we spend collectively in our entire football program over a calendar year um the the, the matchup is not and then you go uh, those schools have 23 more scholarships than we do they have 20 more coaches on staff support staff and, and all um you know, we're running around here trying to afford a secretary at 12 to 15 hours a week and they've got four secretaries in their football program but the matchups shouldn't happen um what does it mean for us our, i think our in-state kids get excited about it for about the first quarter quarter and a half until they see that they can't match up but our in-state kids get really really excited about the matchup for a few minutes well coach thank you so much for your time i really do appreciate it and uh safe travels up this way appreciate you having me hey best of luck i'm a big fan all right that's southern utah head coach delane fitzgerald back to wrap up cougar pregame live next on the new skin byu sports network it's time to hear from the head coach of the byu cougars kalani sataki this is the Cougar Pregame Coaches Show, presented by Zions Bank. For 150 years of helping you succeed, Zions Bank is for you. The Cougar Pregame Coaches Show is also brought to you by Big O Tires. Stop by your locally owned and operated Big O Tires, the team you trust. Let's join Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Football fans, and welcome back inside Lavelle Edwards Stadium on the beautiful Brigham Young University campus in Provo, Utah, for a Saturday matinee as the BYU Cougars take on the T-Birds of Southern Utah in an FBS versus FCS showdown and the second all-time meeting between these two in-state teams who met for the first time during Kalani Sitake's first season as head coach back in 2016. My name is Greg Rubel, and I'll have your play-by-play -play call today. Joined in the broadcast booth by the big man, former BYU and professional lineman Hans Olsen. Hans, after two seasons of build-up that led up to BYU's first ever game as a Big 12 Conference member last week, the Cougs' 14-0 home win over Sam Houston was either a glass half-full or half-empty proposition. The defense was lights out. First shutout in nine seasons. New coordinator Jay Hill delivering an immediate return as the play caller on that side of the ball. On offense, 
uh, there were some injured and absent playmakers, some mental mistakes, some drive-killing penalties, not the offensive showing we become accustomed to under coordinator Aaron Roderick, but it was a true outlier. That was not what you've come to expect at all in hands. We'd be stunned if BYU doesn't bounce back in a big way here today. Well, the way you put it, it was an outlier. It was an outlier for Aaron Roderick, an outlier for this offensive coaching staff. That's exactly what it is, and that's what it should be. And that's what the staff has to go back and make sure that it was an outlier. That at the end of the season, we throw it out and say, yeah, first game jitters. Yeah, injuries at receiver. Yeah, offensive line trying to figure the five out with each other. Yeah, it was just an offense of uh, new running backs. Yeah, 11 transfers trying to find their groove on a field. We need to be able to look back and say it was an outlier. Coming up after this, the pregame thoughts of BYU head coach Kalani Sitake and the latest on the health of the Cougar receiving core as the Zions Bank Cougar pregame coaches show continues. For 150 years of helping you succeed, Zions Bank is for you. My pregame conversation with the coach coming up next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Cougar pregame coaches show continues. Once again, here's Greg Rubel. Well, in 98 previous seasons of BYU football, the Cougars have never, ever opened 2-0 in four consecutive seasons. But with a win today at home over Southern Utah, BYU would win its first two games of the season for a fourth straight season. Hmm. In 2020, it was wins over Navy and Troy to go 2-0. 2021, Arizona and Utah. Then last year, USF and Baylor. Now in 2023, after a season-opening home win over Sam Houston, Southern Utah rolls into Provo, and BYU's never lost to an FCS opponent. The Cougs are 17-0 all-time in those games, and the wins have come by an average score of 48-10. to Time now for my pregame chat with BYU head coach Kalani Sitake, brought to you by Zions Bank. For 150 years of helping you succeed, Zions Bank is for you. And today, while the outcome may not be in doubt, as based on the numbers I just shared with you, Kalani wants to leave no doubt about his team's focus after an inconsistent opener seven days ago. I'm not trying to make it uh, too much out of a small thing here, but it's just like just play our style of football. I think that wasn't um, anything that that we uh, would even recognize. So uh, let's try to. I, I don't think you can eliminate all the mistakes, but um, let's minim- minimize them and then try to find ways to gain you know gain yards, get drives, get some momentum, get in a rhythm, and then get some points on the board. What kind of vibe did you get from your team when you got back to work this week? It's been great. The guys have been amazing. This is, we had a great week of practice. Uh, if any, if anything, um, I, I plan on this being just like what we've done from Monday through Friday, and I feel really good about our preparation. I feel really happy with what the coaches have done, prepping, uh, prepping our guys for this game. Uh, I see the guys have been spending a lot of time scouting um, Southern Utah, so this is an opportunity for us to play at our best in all three phases. We're looking to create some complimentary football and create some momentum as a team and, and, and get something generated today. How much of your challenges from last week offensively are, quote-unquote, quick fixes? Yeah, they're, easy, they're fixable. And, and I think the key for us, I said this in, in the show um, earlier in the week with you, is just focusing on everyone doing their job. They're 111th. They're 111th. And, and doing it as, as best you can. Um, and not trying to do anything other than that. And I think if we can just stay in the, in the, in the boundaries of our own um, individual jobs, I think we'll be fine. You didn't have Keanu Hill or Cody Epps available at wide receiver last week. How do they look for today? Yeah, Keanu will be ready to go. Keebles, uh, he's he's cleared, had a great week of practice. Cody practiced as well, but uh, he'll be a game-time decision. We have to see how, how he does in warm-ups and all that, but uh, definitely we'll get Kibo. Um, it's a kind of a hold on Cody. Pitching a shutout last week defensively, how much of what you saw on the field looked familiar to you in that, oh, I see a Jay Hill defense? Yeah, definitely. It, it's all the stuff that, that uh, speak in my language, you know. So uh, I, don't think, um, it, I don't think this is one of those moments where it's like shutout or, or, or failure. You know, to me it's uh, let's just keep playing sound, assignment sound football, uh, great technique and, and fundamentals. Fundamentals of tackling would be really helpful for our team. So if we can count on that, I think we'll be in a really good spot defensively. Southern Utah will be a tough team to shut out. They went and scored uh, three touchdowns at Arizona State in their opener. Yeah, and the, and, and had the ball uh, with you know in, in the end of the game with a chance to, to go ahead. And, uh, so they're, they're not going to come in here um, 
you know, other than excited, motivated to try to get one because I think they felt like they let one slip away last last week. Yeah, what did Southern Utah show you when you went back and watched that ASU game? Well, the coach is a great coach. He's he's. I mean, the guys are well coached. They're tough, and so they, we can count on them being tough. We need to be physical and tough as well, and and we need to be uh, assignment sound. And if we can get all that done, I think we'll like the the result. The, the, the point is just doing it one play at a time, and not trying to overthink this whole thing. It, it, it's it's not trying to. Uh, I don't know how many points you have to put up to, f- to feel comfortable and I don't know how many points with the defend to feel comfortable I just want to see our guys play what we can identify as BYU football in all three phases. You and a bunch of your coaches have Southern Utah on your resumes and you know what uh, FCS teams uh, feel about playing these kinds of games Of course and obviously you know our, our associate head coach came from uh, from FCS. He, he created a f- powerhouse in, in Weaver State and so we know that these guys, and even the teams like last week, like Sam Houston, that are making the move to FBS, James Madison, all these other teams, North Dakota State, they've been uh, known to, to disrupt and, and, and kind of get some upsets. We need to do our part make sure that doesn't happen today. Feel good about our energy, about the effort. I'd like the preparation. Now just go out there and execute. Speaking of your coaches, one of them won't be with you uh, today. Your hearts are with Kelly Papinga. Yeah, the Papinga family, they're, they're um, going through their loss, and they have the the funeral services going on today in California, so we thought it would be best, and Kelly thought it would be best if he was there to support his family. Uh, he's done he's done an amazing job since he got here on the staff and did a great job this week preparing our, our team, and so I feel good about where we're at and, and uh, having people that can fill in for, for him that he needs to be with his family. That's that's more important right now. Well, we love him, and Cougar Nation wishes the best for him and his family. Hope it's a beautiful day for them, and we have a, a beautiful day for football, a Saturday afternoon kickoff here and, uh, and a second straight home game for you. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Let's get some new tan lines developed today. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, good luck at this old talk to you post game. Go Cougs. Thank you. That is BYU head coach Kalani Sitake. This has been the Zions Bank Cougar pregame coaches show as we had to break. Let's bring you today's Ford keys to the game. They're brought to you by your local Ford stores. BYU football built Ford proud. Hans Olsen has his keys to today's contest. Hans. Well, let's start with this. Wide receivers and running backs need to know their spots and get set. Understand where you're supposed to line up, get there, and get ready for that ball to snap so you can execute properly. Now that sounds like a simple thing, but there were some issues, right? Oh, there were some big issues, but it, it, that's our life, isn't it? You know, my wife tells me, make sure that you're at Walmart at this amount of time and you better be there. And then I'm late to Walmart and then I get in big trouble because I'm not on my spot. That's just how we are. Like we're all susceptible to making mistakes and forgetting or being delayed in that moment. And then you're going to get chewed out by your wife, which I often do. Or your offensive coordinator, Aaron Roderick, who said last week a few too many guys were a little haywire in his words. And I promise you it was a little bit more aggressive (laughs) in the meeting room by Aaron Roderick because he doesn't put up with that stuff. So number two, I expect those wide receivers and running backs to be where they're supposed to be. O-line needs to see the stunts and they need to pick up their guy. We were talking about this in the pregame. Zone sets are supposed to be more conducive to picking up twists and stunts than man pockets or man sets. So if I've got a zoned area, it's supposed to make it easier for me to see this twist or the stunt because I'm not focusing on my number that takes off outside. I focus on my area. And that's just not how it went against Sam Houston. Offensive linemen were getting out of position. They were turning their shoulders, and defensive line on a stunt was coming and getting on the inside of that shoulder and getting the pressure. So just take advantage of what you have in front of you. You've got a zone pocket set. Make sure you pay attention to that. Number three, more and more and then more pressure from the defensive front four. Just more man-on pressure. I want one-on-one rushes. I want a good bull rush. I want to transition from a bull rush to a push pull. I want to transi- transition from a push pull to a nice hand sweep to the outside speed rush. I want rushes, rushes, speed, raw speed, good power off the edge, and pressure that quarterback into the pocket. Make him nervous to throw the football. That will make the difference throughout the season, and this is the perfect game to really start to ratchet that up. Those are Hans's forward keys to the game. Coming up next, the Cougar kickoff show as BYU football coverage continues on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. We're getting closer to kickoff of BYU football. You're tuned to the Ken Garf Cougar Kickoff Show. Ken Garf, we hear you. The Cougar Kickoff Show is also brought to you by Bailey's. We move with you every step of the way since 1952. 
Also brought to you by BYU Creamery, the classic BYU tradition. Have a scoop today. Let's head live to the Feast Box broadcast booth alongside Hans Olsen. Here's the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Good afternoon again, Cougar Nation. We're coming to you live from Lavelle Edwards Stadium as BYU today welcomes Southern Utah to Northern Utah. It's the first time in BYU football history that the Cougs' first two games of the season have included neither a power conference opponent nor back-to-back FBS opponents. BYU looking to go 2-0 before the Cougs start their 10-game grind. Ten straight P5 foes to follow today's contest. This is the Ken Garf Cougar Kickoff Show presented by Ken Garf. Whatever your vehicle needs are, go to KenGarf.com. Ken Garf, we hear you. Uh, Hands, last week's 14-0 home win over Sam Houston, the lowest scoring win of the Kalani Sitake era. In fact, it ended a 21-game losing streak when BYU scored fewer than 21 points. The good news is the BYU defense gave the offense some leeway to have that kind of day. And, Hans, I know that you think many of the first-week offensive issues are fairly fixable. They are fixable, and I know that it probably gets referenced too much, but I think of a football team like Baking. When I've got the right produce or I've got the right ingredients or I've got the right things to put in the bowl, I know eventually I'm going to bake a really good cake. I know that. But when I read half a tablespoon as half a cup and I dump that half cup salt in, it's going to jack it up. That's what they had against Sam Houston. They've got all the right ingredients. They're all there. Every one of them. You got the sugar, you got the flour, you got the baking soda, you got all the things you need. Now, just Put them together the right way. And I think when they do, we're going to see a pop. That's not going to be Hans's last food-related analogy <laughs> that you hear during his tenure. In the next minute. <laughs> Time now to identify this week's e-assist player to watch for BYU. It's brought to you by the e-assist Dental Health Education Foundation, reminding you that dental cleanings are essential for your health. Hans, who do you have as a BYU player to watch today? All right. So I know that this isn't everybody's favorite thing to do, but I want you to take a look at that tackle position and watch Kingsley Suomata'ea. I think he wants to have a better game than he had last week. I think he knows he wants to have a better game, and I think he should have a better game. So watch that offensive outside that's protecting the backside of Keaton Slovis. Just take a look at his steps. Take a look at his aggressiveness. And as I mentioned earlier, he had some really good moments, really good moments. He buried some guys. But he needs to be more consistent. He can't have any of the mental errors that he had last week against Sam Houston. All right. Ken Garp kickoff show continues after we remind you to go to BigOtires.com and make an appointment at one of 50 locally owned and operated Utah locations. Big O Tires, the team you trust. More from Provo after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is the Ken Garf Cougar kickoff show. Let's get back to Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. BYU and SUU coming up, 102 p.m. kick. Second meeting all time between these two. BYU won 37-7 in the first meeting to get bowl eligible back late in the 2016 season. It had been nine seasons without a BYU shutout before the Cougars blanked the Bearcats of Sam Houston last Saturday. In fact, Sam Houston had only one drive all game that began on its half of the field and ended on BYU's half of the field. They punted ten times, turned it over three times. For new defensive coordinator Jay Hill, things could not have gone much better. But he says his guys can get a lot better. Hans, what did you like most from what you saw, and where do you, if you're going to agree with Jay there, think that the defense can improve from last week? Well, people are going to get some unorthodox steel men from me at the end of games. They just are. Last week you chose Blake Mangelson. Blake Mangelson was one of the finer keys of last week's game. It's going to go to Blake Mangelson. It's Tyler Batty. It's Isaiah Banya. It's Jackson Cravens when he's got edge and this extends to the corners Eddie Heckard it goes on to Jacob Robinson it goes on to Ethan Slade oh man I want to give a little bit of praise to Ethan Slade he set a couple of edges it's all about setting the edge you can't let them get outside and you can't let them scoot the sideline and they did a great job of it Blake held the edge Tyler Batty held the edge and that was really nice to see because who there were some defenses in BYU's past that just could not hold a solid edge. 
Time now for today's Hyatt Place Comfort Zone feature. At Hyatt Place Provo, your convenience and comfort will always be our highest priority. And you can feel comfortable about BYU depth in the running back room. You've got a 1,000-yard runner from last season, Aiden Robbins, P5 transfer in Deion Smith, and last week's second-half standout, L.J. Martin. He had almost 100 yards and only two quarters of work. Hands, we expect Robbins to still get his looks. Smith will be in the mix, but BYU's really found something in the freshman from El Paso. So you and I meet every Wednesday to talk shop. And we put hours and hours and hours just going to work, even though talking football is just not really work. And we talked about this Wednesday. I saw things from L.J. Martin that told me that it's not just, oh, there was a hole and a running back could have ran through. No, no. He dodged a couple of different tackles. He made a couple of different safeties stop, pause. He beat them off angles, broke arm tackles. He got the extra yardage through chugging his feet a little bit. I'm hoping that Aiden Robbins felt the pressure, but L.J. Martin did things that were above and beyond what Smith or Robbins did last week. That's Hans Olsen. We're back with more of the Ken Garf Cougar kickoff show from LaBelle Edwards Stadium after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Giveaways in 15 of his 27 games over the last four seasons. BYU's been even or ahead in the turnover margin 32 times in 39 games. And after a subpar red zone season last year, A-Rod wanted better red zone results this year. Well, two for two last week with two touchdowns. Hands, the offense did do some good things. Now it needs to add the consistency and the explosiveness to the ball security and the red zone efficiency. Okay, so I keep my own plus minus, and what I do is I actually subtract for a failed fake punt. So there was one subtraction on a failed fake punt that I'm going to give that as a turnover for BYU. You're still plus two if we do that. Still plus two, which is a a very good margin, no question about it. Remember, going back last week, Southern Utah, an opportunity to beat Arizona State. Why? Because they bust through on a punt formation. They block the punt, they scoop and score that thing, and they take it in. That's another turnover situation. You can't have those types of moments. This isn't just interceptions, and it's not just fumbles. It goes to so many different aspects of controlling the ball, and BYU's got to do that today. Coming up, we'll head down to field level and hear from Mitchell Jurgens as the Ken Garf Cougar kickoff show continues after this, live from the Velibird Stadium in Provo. On the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is the Ken Garf Cougar Kickoff Show. Let's get back to Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. BYU hosting Southern Utah at the top of the hour. 80 degrees right now in Provo, high of 85 and sunshine all over the place. Greg Rubel and Hans Olsen with you in the booth. Down on the field, it's the third member of our commentary crew, former BYU wide receiver Mitchell Juergens. The last time BYU and SUU faced off, Mitch led BYU in catches and receiving yards. He went 6 for 82. BYU beat the T-Birds 37-7 here at home back in 2016. Last week against Sam Houston, BYU's leading receiver was Chase Roberts on 5 for 42. But BYU as a team averaged only 4.4 yards per attempt and 7.2 yards per completion. There's no doubt the absences of Keanu Hill and Cody Epps were felt. Keanu is back today. Cody, we don't necessarily expect to see. But Mitch, where do you expect to see things get better in the pass game today? Yeah, first and foremost, Greg, thanks for the shout out. Always. I should uh, put them, it makes me want to strap them on and get back out there. Uh, But uh, I I do expect Slovis and these receivers to get back on the same page, running the correct routes and avoiding any miscommunications on the field. Uh, That just can't happen consistently at the D1 level. These guys should be reviewing the game script over and over again to ensure everybody knows what to do and where to be. Uh, within the route tree. Uh, Second, I do expect BYU to eliminate the self-imposed penalties. Uh, Week one typically comes with its fair share of penalties as players are working out the jitters, being back in front of 60,000 fans. Uh, So I do expect them to make a significant leap forward and be much more disciplined today. Uh, And then third, I do expect more explosive plays, pass plays down the field for some big yardage gains. Last week, uh, BYU's receivers were only 1 for 7 on contested catches, and Slovis was 0 for 5 on deep balls thrown. I believe this was a fluke. Um, BYU has the talent to fix this, and I expect that to, to correct itself here today. Thank you, Mitch. Great stuff. Coming up next, we'll have coin toss and opening kick. This has been the Ken Garf Cougar kickoff show live from Lavelle Edwards Stadium. On the new skin, BYU Sports Network.